Food is more than just what's on our plate. It's the places where it's grown, it's the people who grow it, and so much more. Join me, Janice Person, your host, on Grounded by the Farm every other week as we talk about the foods we love. I first met Tony White when I was with a big group of people. We were at a chef-driven restaurant. If you're here in St. Louis, it's called Edgewild out in Chesterfield. And Tony was bringing in the tomatoes, and we were eating some of the most glorious tomatoes as an appetizer there. What a great introduction to a farmer. And there are, quite frankly, very few ways to beat that. I mean, what a halo for a person when you're enjoying the food and then he comes in and they introduce him as Tony Tomato. I have to say it was pretty powerful. Now, I understand, Tony, that you got into all of this because you were working in the market related to the yellow pages, but that market was tanking and really getting stressful. And all of that stress and trying to find a way to relieve it is really what led you on a path where you became Tony Tomato. <laughs> it, you know, everything was by accident. You know, you and I had had a chance to chat. You know, I have a background in marketing and started running into some problems. And it, it was becoming stressful. I'm not a gym person. And then I had met this older gentleman who owns land down in the Creek Core Bottoms, right by the lake and right by the airport. And he suggested that, why don't you try a garden? And <laughs> I said, okay. And so all of a sudden I, I, I had this little plot of land and it was probably the size of 25 yards, right? And, and I put a lot of energy in. I lost 20 pounds that summer working that garden. <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> it was the year that we had that wind gust that came through and tore up the airport. Oh, yeah. Down Okay, where that went through Maryland Heights and it went right across the farm and yeah. it broke uh, trees. He has hogs on the property. They got out. They got into my garden. Everything, <laughs> everything got into the garden. I mean, it was just it was a total failure. I mean, at the end of the season, I just had two plates of peppers <laughs> and the farmer laughed. And, you know, and the person that was at that time, she kind of chuckled and said, OK, well, it looks like you're not too good at this thing here. But, you know, I'm a pretty motivated person, very competitive. And uh, that led to the next year where we fenced in four acres of the 17 and started the garden. Mm -hmm. And then from and then from there, everything that I put into the ground grew and we had so much produce that was coming in. And it was out. It was just everywhere. I had to solicit everyone that we knew who knew how to can. And, you know, from that year, we made watermelon jelly. We had tomato jams. We, you know, we pickled tomatoes. We, we took, you know, <laughs> Hungarian peppers and made mustard out of it here. And it was just, I mean, it was a real fun time, but it was a lot of work that was involved. <laughs> and uh, the person I was involved with at that time said, look, if you're going to do this garden thing next year, if we can't consume this food in three days, just take it across the street and sell it. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, that's a great idea. And it just happened that a restaurant from the Hill had relocated a second location there in Chesterfield Baldwin called Mia Sorella. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it was just, I mean, you're talking 75 yards away from our house. So we walked across and had dinner all the time. So had a good relationship with the, you know, with the owner. And, you know, we'll come back to that a little bit later on because that is, that was the beginning of how this business got started. And um, I walked in and I said, Steve, I think I can grow tomatoes. And he said these words, I will buy everything that you produce if it's picked at the peak of perfection. Oh, yeah. And I just smiled and I said, you better watch out because here I come, right? <laughs> I love so, it. <laughs> it was like the first week of July that year. Um, my two young kids, you know, I had them work in the farm and, you know, just really getting them engaged. And, you know, my, my daughter is she's on her way to become a doctor who bases on nutrition. And I just kind of wondered, wow, eating those tomatoes in the field. I wonder what that was that part of, you know, what gave her the influence of wanting to eat healthy. But we showed up that night with 300 pounds of heirloom tomatoes and the craziest thing, the people that own Cafe Napoli were, were dining next door at a restaurant next door, just a burger place next door. He came out and it was like 830 at night. So picture 
Here's Steve Komarak <laughs> and here's Andy Piatoso. And these guys are in a bidding war over the tomatoes that we have that are at the, on the tailgate of our truck. And my youngest son, his eyes were just so big. It was just like, whoa, 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 what's going on here? And that night, we wound up selling those 300 pounds for about $800. It was $850. And the kids were just like, whoa. So I turned to them and said, here's a check. Here's your, here's your, your fall school clothes. Enjoy. But Steve Komarek <laughs> won the bid that night. And then I remember telling Andy, I'll see you on Tuesday. Because you know, once your harvest mm-hmm. starts coming in, you got tomatoes coming, right? And and then that's just how this thing got started. And it went from to him. I went to Annie Guns. And they said, yes. I went to Edge Wild, where we met at. And they said, sure, we'll take it. I walked over across the street to Yaya's. And all of a sudden, I got this tomato business. <laughs> <laughs> you became Pony Tomato. <laughs> right. You know, and, and it was funny. You know, the um, um, one of my customers called me. So oh, there's a tomato guy. His name is Tony. Tony Tomato. Tony Tomato. You know, I'm like, <laughs> I said, okay, uh, I guess if it sticks, it works. And, you know, I had spent some time in New York with uh, the pub- with the telephone company and I met some um, corporate consultants in that area. And I kind of called him and I said, hey, I got this thing going and it's actually having a better stickiness than my publication is. I don't know. And he goes, well, you need to, you know, stick with the, stick with the slogan, you know, like for instance, KFC, it's Kentucky Fried Chicken, right? Famous mm-hmm. Amos Cookies, you know. The men's warehouse. He goes, you have to, as a business, try to distinguish yourself from everybody else. He goes, a tomato is just a tomato, but if it becomes a Tony tomato, then there's a connection that people have with it. You know, I love it. I love it. So, so you started out with heirloom tomatoes, sort of big slicing tomatoes, right? right. Beef steak, your traditional red tomatoes and heirloom tomatoes, and that's how this thing got started, and then it led into the cherry tomatoes. And then, you know, all of a sudden when you start getting into farming in Missouri, our season is not quite, uh, you know, I mean, it's warm here, you know, I mean, mm-hmm. we like, a lot of people like to plant in April, but you got to be careful because it could snow in April and that could kill everything that you've got going on. Right. But, um, you know, we figured out a way to turn our field three times. So we'll start with coal crops and then we'll get into the tomatoes and we'll get into the, some of the fall crops. And, you know, my, gr- the things that I grow are, are based on what my chefs want. And that's how, <laughs> that's how it, that's what pretty much determines what's happening. That's awesome. So are you still on that same farm where you started gardening? I am. I am. Yes, we are. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so there was three of us that was out there. Now there's just two of us. And so we just kind of split it right down the middle. And, you know, he's the one that has the, the big tractor. But, you know, I'll, I bring in folks or whatever needs to get done. You know, if, I, if it's over my scope or, you know, if I can't, you know, do it in the course of a day, then I'll solicit some help. And, you know, there's a lot of people that like getting their hands dirty. And they go, oh, I love to have a garden. I always try to encourage them. Well, don't worry about that garden. Come out, come out, give me a hand here. You know, we'll get, we'll get that filled. We'll get all the, the gardening in that you want. And the benefit yeah. is you get a chance to have a bunch of fresh, fresh, fresh produce throughout the course of the year as well. Yeah, it's funny. Um, I, th- I think people tend to think it's great to have a garden, but most of us start doing it and it's so much work. But if you can find community gardens where you can contribute or something, it seems to work better for some of us. Some of us want the a- autonomy of doing their own thing, but others of us are like, I think maybe somebody else who knows what we're doing would be helpful. <laughs> well, you know, if you, yeah, I mean, here in the Midwest, you don't have to go far to run into someone who has a grandparent that loves tomatoes and they spent their life, you know, figuring it out how to grow them. And, and, and they want to kind of follow that footsteps because, you know, there is nothing like a fresh tomato if you love them. I mean, that, that juiciness, that flavor is just incredible. Incredible. I'm Southern and they say in, in that movie, Still Magnolias, you know, you're not Southern if you're not growing tomatoes. So oh. <laughs> I, I still, I still grow them, but um, I keep sun sugars, the small orange oh, yes. kind of cherry mm-hmm. tomatoes at my front right. door. Okay. <laughs> so there you go. In the summer as you come and go. Yeah. Well, you know, now that you mentioned that, you know, there's a lot of people that really, they see the big heirloom tomatoes and they want to plant them, right? And, and they make the, the common mistakes of either overwatering them and they, you know, and not trimming those plants so that the nutrients are getting to 
or they just have a lot of animals that really will decimate what's going on. Squirrels kill you in my neighborhood, but the orange (laughs) tomatoes, they don't eat as much. They don't, Mm -hmm. the color's not as bright or something. It doesn't attract them as much. I don't know. Yeah, that's strange. But I always encourage people just to grow cherry tomatoes. Just get the get the planter boxes and put it on your porch and, and watch them grow. And you'll produce so many tomatoes, you know, and there are so many different varieties of colors that you'll have a lot more success than you will, you know, trying to grow the bee sticks. I know the people from Burpee, are, they don't want to hear that, but that's just what I just tell everybody, you know. Again, if you yeah. want to grow big tomatoes and you live in St. Louis, come out to the farm. You know, we'll always have something <laughs> for you to do. <laughs> well, and we had talked to somebody the other day who grew processing tomatoes and the idea of getting disease if you plant the same spot and which right. ones are resistant to this disease or that disease and all that kind of stuff so we've talked about that with a farmer how complicated it could get so maybe i should ask you how many varieties are you planting now that you've gotten the tony tomato business going you know that's a very good question um how many varieties do i plant today well, when I started, I had 10 to 15 varieties that I tried growing. Yep. Now, I learned fast that some will grow better than others, right? Mm-hmm. But the other concern becomes, let's say if I, if I planted a black creme, okay, which is a nice, colorful, cool tomato, but I only had 30 plants out. And if you're averaging, you know, 10 to 15 pounds, well, that's only 300 pounds of of that particular variety. And and depending on how you stagger planting them, they could all come in together at the same time. Now, when you're, you know, dealing with a lot of customers, 300 pounds of tomatoes don't last long when you're, you know, when you're trying to encourage them to have a really nice tomato salad, right? Yeah. So, um, so today, you know, I usually have somewhere between 1,800 to 2,500 plants for tomatoes that I grow. Wow. Right. Yeah. It's, it, but that's nothing compared to my neighbor who might have 10, you know, 10,000. And yeah. some of the people that, that, con- that I contract with, you know, they may have 20,000 plants, but they've got the space and they have the labor to kind of make things happen and they can grow it, you know, the varieties that I want. So I, I usually grow one or two different varieties of red tomatoes. And that's what I had out in the area. Now I may put in, you know, 150, you know, mountain gold or something with some color that I have it Mm -hmm. because sometimes some of the farms that I, that we have to bring the product back, you know, it's, it's an, it's an hour, hour and a half drive to get to their place. But, and I may have a customer who just had a a massive runoff or sell off or some type of event says, Tony, I need 300 pounds of yellow tomatoes. I'm like, okay, how are we going to coordinate this? You know? So Mm -hmm. I do keep an an additional variety at, at the farms. Um, and I don't grow cherry tomatoes because I just don't have the labor to pick them. You know, when you like your sun gold, I mean, that plant could have, you know, 50, 60 tomatoes that you're picking at a time. And that takes a lot of time to collect (laughs) and gather all of those items off the plant there. So I just like, let's get this, you know, six to 10 ounce, 12 ounce, or even a, a one pound tomato. And let's just pick it and go. It look beautiful and, and we can run out there. But now, you know, for different um, heirlooms, you know, one of the farms will have five different varieties that are grown there. And then I have another farm that grows cherry tomatoes for me. And there may be 15 different variety of cherry tomatoes that are out there. Mm-hmm. But again, the success there is they have young kids that are out in the field picking and you know and I try to encourage them because when I come to pick them up I'm not their fan that week they're like you know I couldn't play because we had to pick these cherry tomatoes Tony (laughs) I love it I have a friend who has three daughters and they do three daughters tomatoes or something oh yes that's the young group that's the young group out in Wildwood they grow some very nice heirlooms they do a good job they're Mm -hmm. they do a great job Eric Mm -hmm. and his girls so (laughs) that's how they pay for college I think is the deal so how often do you plant tomatoes do you start planting and and continue planting for a a period of time or is it more moving out of one set of crops into another so uh, very good question and you you want to so here's here's the 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 tomato game okay 
everybody has spring fever, right? Everybody wants to oh, rush yeah. out and plant that tomato because, you know, we'll have, you know, 60, 65 degree weather days in April, right? And it may be mm. the course of a four or five day period. Well, every grower right now is already starting to plant the tomato seeds, okay? And so they're going to be ready to sell you those, those you know, three inch potted tomato plants, right? Yeah. That's the business, right? And And every, you know, wholesaler, you know, big box store is going to have some tomato plants around, okay? So I try to go a little less at the very beginning because of the risk, right? Uh, so I'll, I mean, and, and what I've learned here in Missouri, and you got your, every soil is, every climate is different, right? I mean, if I put something in the ground at April 15th, because I just got to get it out of my system and my anxieties are just going so crazy. <laughs> and then I plant May 1st, you know, two weeks later. Well, ironically enough, you know, 72 days later, 80 days later, all those tomato plants are still ripening at the same time. So I really haven't gained anything except for just burnt off some additional energy, right? So I've learned to be a little patient. And so the first, so usually around May 1st, Mother's Day, you know, is kind of what I kind of gear for, right? If it's at the beginning of the month, I'll try to put in 700 to 1,000 plants, the first planting, okay? Mm. And then I'll wait another 45 days and I'll do another planting. And then okay. another 30 days, I'll do my final planting. Because what I was starting to say is there's a point where the market is saturated with tomatoes, right? And I mean, everybody, you know, once that crop comes in, you got to have a place to go with it, right? And as a person who's trying to, you know, keep the consistency going, I don't really try to, you know, run with the crowd, right? I, I, I'm okay, you know, let's, let, let's get their product out there. Because the market prices, it's supply and demand, correct? If the, great, if the supply is great, the price is going to be lower. And so yeah. I'll, you know, I'll work with that. But again, my growers, I come in every year with an average. This is what happened last year. Here's a fair market price that I'm going to pay you to produce, you know, X thousands of pounds for me each week. Okay. And what they, what we've learned, you know, and sometimes it gets very frustrating because the, the market could really drop because of the supply, but I'm still paying a higher rate for it. But then when the market, you know, starts to go crazy, okay, I'm still at a very nice average. They're happy, I'm happy. And so that's kind of how we, how we kind of work it. So three plantings a year is what I usually focus on. And then my other folks, I let them kind of do what they want to do on that. Nice, nice. So um, I I can totally understand that because there's a point at which you almost can't give away tomatoes. It's not like right. zucchini. People don't, you know, people aren't that desperate to get rid of them, but there's right. definitely more high flavored tomatoes in the market at one time. Mm -hmm. And so it makes sense that that's not your peak time to right. sell to customers because mm -hmm. they get them from lots of sources. Right. So, and remember, you know, Janice, my, my mission is <clears throat> red tomatoes all year long. Right. And so we have to try to make sure that we're, we got the right market balance out there, but also, you know, there's a, there's so much business out there for everybody. I don't really stress over that anymore. It's just like, okay, do your thing because I know in two weeks you're, you're going to be out of the game. Okay. There aren't too many tomato focused businesses. Right. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. That's mm -hmm. really awesome. So, so you want to have them all year long. So, do you, you work with some farmers that have greenhouses or hoop houses or all open of the field? above? And then yeah. one that you haven't even probably heard of is a glass house. You know the oh, yeah. the Danish the Danish folks really have figured out how to grow you know indeterminate tomato plants fifteen feet high in a glass house structure the size of seven football fields. And so we're starting to see that technology show up today in our markets. I mean, at least for the last five years or so, it really has started making a, um, an appearance and they're producing a tomato that's really decent. I mean, you know, yesterday it was 60 degrees, right? And, yep. you know, I was at a family friend's barbecue and, you know, I brought in <laughs> Caprice salads and they're like, whoa, these tomatoes. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> that's that's yeah. exactly right. And and Actually, so I, 
I found that in the in North America, that typically is out in British Columbia, and but in the Vancouver area, typically right. has that kind of glass house. Yeah, well, you know, in Vancouver, I mean, it's beautiful up there, but you also have gray skies that are just insane. You know, surprisingly enough, we actually receive more moisture here in St. Louis than they do in Vancouver, but it's just so <laughs> consistent that that canopy cover is just there. So those glass houses. You know, they really, you know, the temperatures are 70 degrees and they can control the lighting and, you know, and, and I mean, those tomatoes are in ideal growing conditions and it seems to work. So when, you know, so we start around May planting, right? And then usually the first hard frost is what knocks us, the local stuff out the market, right? right. You know, I mean, they're, they're gone, you know, I mean, that, that frost hits. And you would think, I mean, like my growers, they disappear for the winter. They're like, see you later, right? <laughs> now, I've talked to a couple of them who have high tunnels, you know, because we can lift the sides up and let air pass through and try to keep everything mm -hmm. flowing that way. And so I usually rely on them, you know, oct early October, because there's a little overlap because we still have some, you know, if it's an Indian yeah. summer or, you know, or Indian winter, you know, fall, we're great. But then we'll, we'll go right about to December, then we'll start transitioning from the high tunnels to the glass house yeah. and maybe a few greenhouses. And then that glass house provides us tomatoes all the way up until May. Okay. So there's that overlap, you know, that's there. So that's how we're able to kind of keep our business going all year long and providing, you know, a decent tomato. That's amazing. So are there other tomato brokers or... <laughs> tomato specialist around the U.S. I mean, in each big market, is there somebody like you? You know, um, no, there really isn't because, <laughs> <laughs> and that's, you know, it's really funny because I do have some friends that are in the, you know, the, the food business that work for some of the big distributors. You know, there's, you know, like U.S. Foods, you know, P&G, the Kunas, yeah. the Old Time Produce, you know, those folks are out there. But they really focus on so many other things from, you know, they, they want to service the whole restaurant or schools or mm -hmm. prisons. I mean, that's where their business is at. And, you know, tomatoes has just kind of been like, OK, well, we don't really have the proper facility to, you know, to keep those tomatoes at, you know, 50 degrees. We just don't want to allocate that. We just want to just bring us in the tomatoes from, you know, down south or from wherever, you know, Florida will produce a few tomatoes at this time of year. And we'll gas them because they're picked green and we'll ship them across. And, you know, there's a lot of businesses that really, you know, still don't have that much of a desire to put a great tomato on. But there are other restaurants that do. And you can see, you, you know, once you start having that happen, then you're going to obviously gravitate to them. But there's people that just do volume, you know, I mean, all day long. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned you took a caprese salad. Is that one of your favorite ways to eat tomatoes? I, I what are the other dishes that you go to? Oh, my goodness. For tomatoes? Well, I mean, the caprese salad is fantastic because it's just such a mind, you know, blowing thing to, to walk in with this. God, these tomatoes are red and they're flavorful, right? I, I love that. Um, you know, I, I just, my, my thing I just uncovered this past year was finding some real fresh burrata and then putting that on top of the uh, top of the tomato that's i mean i just that's delicious in the summer i th there's just something that's just so beautiful about you know a big variety of heirloom tomatoes and then you mix that heirloom tomatoes with you know green uh, cherry tomatoes some of your sun gold you know types of tomatoes mm -hmm. and you know there's small little black ones and then that just presentation just really blows you away you know and yeah. i love salsa also i mean that's the other thing we were at a you know super bowl party and Here's some salsa that comes in and, hey, the tomatoes are red. They're not, you know, translucent, you know. So, I mean, obviously, I love tomatoes. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good thing because you probably spend a lot of time focused on it. Right. And, and then, you know, and it's so funny, you know, I, um, I'm six years from a divorce. And so I've been, you know, I was dating for a while. And one of my criteria is every time I ask somebody is that, so do you like tomatoes? <laughs> it's a screening question because right because if you don't you're we're not going to make it honey okay 
Because you're going to have tomatoes it. coming out of your, you're going to hear tomatoes conversations all day long, you know. <laughs> That's funny. I thought in the Midwest it was more sweet corn because Southerners, I think Southerners love their tomatoes more than the Midwest. Mm. But Tony, you're making me think that other, there are others like me in the area that just love tomatoes so much. Yes, indeed. Hey, bicolor sweet corn is delicious as well, too. You know? <laughs> oh, I, I did not mean any slap towards sweet corn, but, <laughs> but folks in this part of the world can talk about sweet corn way more than I can. I can talk mm -hmm. about tomatoes a lot longer. Um, mm. One of the things I wanted to ask you, you, you kind of mentioned how you got into restaurants with all these different people just happen to be right next door or right across the street. How did you deal with COVID? And I kind of watch you on Instagram and stuff. So I kind of think I know a little bit of it, but like many farmers, your market just kind of tanked overnight, but you probably already had a lot of tomatoes in the ground in oh March God. and we're starting more tomatoes in the I ground. When you know, it was very interesting because I had a very good friend who used to, um, who was a scientist and um, she worked with Monsanto and um, I was, we were watching the Super Bowl and we were watching what was going on overseas in Italy and in, in China. And she looked at me and she said, this is going to be really bad. And I didn't know how to gauge that, right? You know, because today she's she's a therapist and, you know, they're always calm about everything, right? But she said, no, this is going to be really bad. We need to order some, some M95 mask and you need to get your house, your business in order. So I looked at, well, what, where am I, where, where are my, you know, weaknesses at with my, with my business? And like most people, you know, when you're the main guy, you're the ship captain and crew, right? And so I, my focus is I love engaging with my chefs. I love selling the product. I'll send the invoice, <laughs> cut, it, cut me the check when you, when you get a chance, right? Mm -hmm. and, and that was a, an area that I, I, I felt that if we were going to have some problems, I really need to get my act together and tighten that up. And so I did have an, an, an aging report that was rampant i mean was was out of control right i mean i had quite a few people that were in the 60 to 90 day window and so when we you know started focus over you know i had you know my accountant and i said okay let's start getting our invoices out let's start getting some reminders and let's start making sure that we cover our bases we really started covering the gap there and mm -hmm. uh, there was you know there was almost an annual salary that was floating out there that we were able to reel it in you know within an acceptable number okay um, but when that when they announced the shutdown, I had no idea that that was ever going to be conceived or it was coming. It was a big punch in the gut. And yeah. all of a sudden, everything was I mean, for two weeks, like everybody else, we just hid under our beds, you know, trying to make sure that <laughs> <laughs> we were out of sight. Yeah. You know, it came to me that the grocery store lines were starting to get, you know, people were making the run for the for the toiletry items, you know, which was like insane. And, and, you know, all of a sudden, now, wait a minute, are we not going to have any more cows? We're not going to have any more. I mean, there was still produce that was being produced, but yeah. we just had to figure out how to get it to the people. And, and people were, you know, the lines at every grocery store, I mean, it was just ridiculous. They were lining up around. And, and so we said, all right, let's kind of pivot to, let's start pivoting to home delivery. Mm -hmm. Now, as farmers and as business people, one of the things that we don't have is a lot of time, right? But, you know, the environment that I grew up in with my mom, it was always about community service and involvement. You know, in her case, it was with the church. And then today for me, it's just with the different businesses, you know, like the Chesterfield Chamber of Commerce or Chesterfield Regional Chamber mm -hmm. of Commerce. And so I had been involved with them, their golf committee, you know, had the, those assignments, got involved with their, you know, their quarterly publication out and about. And um, when the pandemic hit, now, you know, the other media sources are looking for story and suggestions. Hey, can we identify some folks? You know, the Post-Dispatch reached out and they said, you know, in Seattle, we've done this. We, 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 uh, we identified seven different businesses and then we just kind of followed them throughout this whole piece. Would you like to be part of that? 
And so becoming <laughs> part of that gave me some great exposure to here's this whole new business that I'm or a whole new entity within my business that I'm trying to get involved with, right? And then yeah. that led to Fox News, Chris Haynes coming out saying, hey, we like to do a story on you because you're local and we're hearing this. And that synergy just kind of really just helped me explode into this whole other division within my company. And so that's what really kind of got me through the whole process. You know, the restaurants kind of figured out how to open back up, but they still were really slow and into, you know, coming back to the tomato volume that I had because, you know, everybody's trying to survive, right? And they're yeah. not willing to buy a $3 pound tomato when they can get one for a dollar. They just said, we just, we just want to throw something on the menu. I mean, on it. Right. So I had to work through that, but then there were some of my good, my better restaurants in the area here really said, you know, we're still going to continue to serve even on the takeout stuff because we want people to experience the quality. And, you know, I mean, takeout food isn't the same as having the dining indoor dining experience. Right. And yeah. so that's what some of them were really concerned with. So they said, as soon as we start to open back up at the 25%, the 40%, then things are starting to grow. And then I also realized that, well, I have this food delivery business now, you know? And, <laughs> so and, what else know, can you deliver? Eggs? Right, right, mushrooms. right. Mushrooms. Right. Yes, you know, I mean, you know, so we, I mean, it's, the, the produce box has everything in it. I mean, you know, as, you know, right before our meeting today, I was just laying out the list of things that I need to, pick up from some of the wholesalers because I mean, I don't grow potatoes, right. Or oranges and, and stuff like that. But I, right. I work with a couple of distributors and I pick up those items from them as we build these boxes out, but we still have local butternut squash. We still have locally grown acorns, you know, the fall crops. Yeah, exactly. How has your business kind of recovered then? Cause restaurants are back pretty much to normal around here. Some staffing right. issues and stuff, so they're not, mm -hmm. you know, necessarily back to where they were before, but pretty normal. And then you have this extra delivery business. So have you somehow been able to grow your business throughout all this now? We, you know, the pandemic did claim a good portion of restaurants. Yep. This year, I've been tracking the numbers, you know, of sales prior to COVID going into COVID and then currently now. And so the numbers that I've been, that I've posted, you know, for January were very close to what pre COVID numbers were. Okay. So the trend is climbing up. I mean, I know even with this month, right. When I look at um, two years ago, you know, it isn't quite what those numbers were, but they're better than last year. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and I mean, when I say better than last year, I mean, I've already have exceeded about 25% of what I did the year before. And I still have another 10 days to go within this month. So I'm going to have a pretty decent month here, provided we can still get out to the restaurants without ice and snow and stuff like that, because this, this brother doesn't get out on the icy roads. Okay. <laughs> I don't either. <laughs> I don't either. Well, if people want to, get a produce box here in St. Louis, or if they think, oh my gosh, I would love to know more about how I can get those kind of tomatoes. Mm -hmm. Where, where do people find you? Yeah. The easiest way is just to type in Tony tomato or go to Facebook or Instagram uh, or Tony white. And, you know, on Instagram, you'll see me pop up and it, the slogan is tomato, Tony, Tony, Tom or Tony tomato underscore tomato, Tony. But the easiest one is on Facebook. And just type in Tony's Family Farms, and then you'll see it pop up. And if you know, if you want to be more specific, Tony Family Farms, Tony Tomato, and then you'll see the site appear. And then just send me a message. Um, sign up for our newsletter on our website. It's you know the website is tomatotony.xyz, and it, every two weeks we'll send out a newsletter. And it will tell you what's kind of happening and we'll kind of give you some tips on what you should be doing with your farm, you know, or with your gardening. And if you want to buy a produce box, that would be the time you sign up. And it's very simple. There's no subscription required. Our produce boxes are a little bigger than other folks. I know there's some people that will do a $25 produce box. Ours are with tax, you know, local taxes is $65.80, but it's a lot of produce that we drop off. <laughs> yeah. And things like tomato, uh, potatoes and onions and stuff. Mm -hmm. Those are things that you can keep around for a little bit. 
Right. You know, I mean, like I said, you know, uh, what, you know, we do a lot of work with Operation Food Search. And as we were, you know, creating a custom box for them, you know, they indicated that they love cabbage. I'm not a fan of cabbage, but, you know, there's a lot of people that can do a lot of things with cabbage. So we just follow their lead because we like, you know, we listen to what you're my, what you're looking my for. My niece was making egg rolls last night, so I'm sure she oh. had some cabbage involved. Okay. See, so. All right. All right. All right. So I just <laughs> learned something today. <laughs> well, Tony, thank you so much for joining us on the show. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Janice, for having me. Okay, it's good seeing you again, okay? <laughs> good seeing you. And that wraps up our episode with Tony Tomato. Talking all things tomato is pretty much the sweet spot for me. Would appreciate it if you have friends that you know, love great restaurants and love a great Caprese salad. Give them a chance to give this a listen. Send them the link on your favorite platform. Just tell them, hey, you guys ought to hear this. Encourage them to listen to some of the back episodes. You can always find us on social media or check out our website, groundedbythefarm.com. Talk to you again in two weeks.